In the first question, it says work out 74.6 times 10 minus 3.89 times 100. So we start with converting the decimals into fractions. We move the decimal one place to the right and two places to the right in 3.89. So that's going to be 746 over 10 times 10 minus 389 over 100 times 100. So the 10 gets canceled out, the 100 gets canceled out. So we're left with 746 minus 389, which is going to equal 357. So always remember when you have like decimals being multiplied by tens or hundreds, so what you'll do is you'll convert the decimal into a fraction, cancel out the zeros, and subtract or add whatever the question asks you to do. Part B says five plus three times two minus one. So this is bit mass. First we do brackets, if there are any. Then we do indices then division, multiplication, add, and lastly, subtract. So if you look at our equation, we have addition, multiplication, and subtraction. Looking at bit mass, multiplication comes before addition and subtraction. So we're going to do three times two first. So three times two is six. So five plus six minus one. Next we have addition. So we'll do five plus six, which is going to give us 11. And then 11 minus one is 10. So that is your answer. Question two has given us these numbers and it's saying from the numbers above, write down a factor of 70. In order for a number to be a factor of 70, it also has to be a multiple of 7. So if you look at these numbers, 14 is the only one who has a multiple of 7. If we split 70, 70 is 7 times 10, and 10 is 5 times 2. And we know 7 times 2 is 14. Hence, 40 is in a factor of 70. Then a cube number. 125 is 5 times 5 times 5. So this is our cube number. An irrational number. An irrational number is basically that number that cannot be expressed as the ratio of two integers. So we know 15 can be expressed as a ratio of two integers. One to 125 can be. But if you look at root 8, root 8 is basically going to give us a huge number like 2.82 and so on and on. Root 8 is an irrational number. Irrational numbers are mostly thirds. 25 is also a third, but root 25 would give us 5, which is a which is like a whole number which can't be expressed as a ratio of two numbers. So in this case, root 8 is the only irrational number. Question 3 says work out 3 over 7 plus 2 over 5. So what we'll do is We'll start with making the denominators equal for both fractions because whenever we're, whenever we're adding unlike denominators, the first step is to make the denominators equal. So you multiply the first fraction by 5 and the second fraction by 7. That's going to give us 15 over 35 plus 14 over 35. Now 15 plus 14 is 29. So 29 over 35 is our answer to this sum of fractions. Then it says find 2 thirds of 6 over 11, giving your answer as a fraction in its simplest form. 2 thirds of is always multiplication times 6 over 11. 3 ones are 3, 3 twos are 6. 2 times 2 over 11, which is 4 over 11. Question four says, a record is kept of the water level in a harbor. One morning, the level is five meters. 
uh, that afternoon the level is negative two meters. Find the difference between the level in the morning and the level in the afternoon. So we'll do five minus negative two. Now, whenever we're subtracting a negative integer from a positive integer, it becomes plus. So five plus two, which is seven meters. Then it says one day the temperature at midday is nine degrees Celsius. At midnight, the temperature has dropped by 15.3. Find the temperature at midnight. So since it says dropped, so it's going to be minus. So 9 minus 15.3, which is going to be negative 6.3 degrees Celsius. Why negative? Because whenever we're subtracting integers and the number that has basically this, Whenever we're subtracting integers, your answer will have the sign of that number, which has a higher value. 15.3 has a higher value compared to 9. Hence, the answer is negative. You're basically taking out a bigger number from a smaller number. So the answer is going to be negative. Question 5 says the diagram shows a quadrilateral ABCD with AD extended to E. Angle BCD is 135. Angle BAD is 83 and angle CDE is 122. Find the value of X. So first what we're going to do is we're going to find this angle. The angle CDA is going to be 180 minus 122. Why 180 minus 122? Because this is a supplementary angle. And sum of supplementary angles equal to 180. So 180 minus 122 is going to give us 58, which is this. Then since this is a quadrilateral, sum of angles of a quadrilateral equal to 360. So we'll say x equals to 360 minus 135 minus 83 and minus 58. We subtract all of the given angles from 360 to find the unknown angle. And that's going to be 84 degrees. Question six says write 308 as a product of its prime factors. So let's split 308. Now 308 is basically divisible by two because it's an even number. So 154 times two is 308. Two is a prime number, so we can't further break it down. But 154 becomes 77 times two. 77 is seven times 11. So our prime factors are seven times 11 times two square. Then it says find the highest common factor of 308 and 66. So let's split 66. 66 is six times 11, and six is three times two. So three times two times 11 for 66. And for 308, we had seven times two square times 11. So as you can see, our highest common factor is we have 11 in common, and then we have one two in common. So that means two times 11, which is 22. This is our highest common factor. Question seven says, the diagram shows a trapezium A, B, C, D. A, B is seven, D, C is 10, the area of ABCD is 85 centimeters square. The perpendicular height of the trapezium is given as H centimeters. Find its value. So first thing first, we need to know the formula for this. Area of a trapezium is one over two times perpendicular height times sum of 
parallel sides. This is the formula that we're going to use. So 85 equals to one over two times h times seven plus 10. Your perpendicular lengths are this and this, these two parallel lines. So your parallel lengths are these two lines, AB and DC. So that's going to be, we do 85 times 2, which is going to equal 170, 17H. So 10 is H. So 10 centimeters is the value of H. Question 8 says simplify 6x plus 15 minus 2x plus 8. So you're going to collect the like terms. 6x and negative 2x and 15 and 8. So that's going to give us 6x minus 2x plus 15 plus 8, which is going to be 4x plus 23. Expand and simplify x minus 5 whole square. x minus 5 whole square is basically x minus 5 times x minus 5, which is going to be x times x, x times negative 5, negative 5 times x, and negative 5 times negative 5, which is x square minus 5x minus 5x plus 25. That's going to equal to x square minus 10x plus 25. Insert the correct symbol. So 0 0.6 kg and 60 grams. So first thing first, 1 kg is 1,000 grams. So convert both the quantities in the same metric unit. So I'm going to convert 0 0.6 kgs into grams, which is going to be 600 grams. Over here, I'm going to convert the kilometers into meters. So 15,000 meters. One kilometer is 1,000 meters. And one meter squared is going to be 10,000 centimeters squared. Why? Because if one meter is a hundred centimeters, then one meter squared is going to be hundred times hundred, which is ten thousand centimeter squared. So four is going to be forty thousand centimeter squared. So now that we've converted them into the same units, now we can compare. So six hundred grams is obviously greater than sixty grams. 15,000 meters is equal to 15,000 meters and 40,000 centimeters square is also greater than 400 centimeters square. This is your greater for those who are still confused about that. And this is your less than. Question 10 says by writing each number correct to one significant figure, estimate the value of this. 36.24 will be 400. 187.2 will be 200. 52.3 is going to be 50. Always remember that in like significant figures, if you're trying to convert like a decimal number into like a one significant figure form, you're going to focus on the first number. So the first number is going to be greater than zero and the other ones are going to be all zeros. So 362.4 is more near to 400 as compared to 300. Hence, 362.4 becomes 400. 187.2 is more near to 200 than 100. So that becomes 200. And 52.3 is more near to 50 rather than 60. So we round that to 50. So now we have 400 minus 200 over 50, which is 200 over 50. And that is four. 
Question 11 says, in a survey, three out of every 100 women were taller than 1.9 meters. One of these 100 women is picked at random. Calculate the probability that she is not taller than 1.9. So the probability of uh, women uh, greater than 1.9 is 3 over 100. So the probability of women not greater than 1.9, or basically less than 1.9, is going to be 1 minus 3 over 100, which is 97 over 100 or 0 0.97. You subtract the probability of the other thing happening from 1 to get the probability of the thing that is not happening. Then a new housing estate is being planned. There are three possible plans, A, B, and C. A survey was carried out to see which plan people preferred. The relative frequency table shows the results. 52 people preferred plan C. Find out how many people preferred A. So what we'll do is, we will do 52 equals to 0 0.2 times the total people. Since 0 0.2 times the total people give us the people who prefer plan C, so using this, we're going to first find the total number of people. So 52 divided by 0 0.2, which is going to equal to 60. That is the total people. Now using this, for A, it's going to be 0 0.3 multiplied by 260 which is basically 26 times 3, and that is 78. Let's just calculate the total number of people, which we already did, 260. Bernard bought a game in the USA for $15. Alice bought the same game in Zambia and paid the equivalent price in Zambia Quacha. And one Zambia Quacha equals to $0.075. Calculate the price that Alice paid. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide the dollar by 0 0.075. So we move the decimal three places to the right and add three zeros in the numerator, 15, 1000 divided by 75, and that is going to equal to 200 because both 15,075 are divisible by 5. This would be 3000. This would be 15. Then this would be 1, and this would be 200. So 200 is the answer. Question 13, two numbers x and y such that x ratio y is 5 is to 11 and x plus y equals to 112. Find x and y. So what we're going to do over here is create a ratio for, create a fraction for x first. So x is going to be 5 over 5 plus 11. And then we're going to times it by the total, which is 112. So 5 over 16 times 112, and that's going to equal 35. And for y, we're going to do the same. 11 over 5 plus 11 times the total, which is 112. 11 over 16 times 112, which is going to be 77. An alternate method would have been that once you've calculated x, we could have done y is 112 minus 35, which is also 77. This is the term to term rule for a sequence, multiply by two and add three. They've given us the first three terms, they want us to find the next term. So we'll pick the third term, 13, times that by two, and then add three. So 13 times 2 is 26. 26 plus 3 is 29. 
Then it says the term to term rule for a different sequence square and subtract 5. The second and third terms in the sequence are negative 1 and negative 4. Write down the fourth term. So we'll pick the third term negative 4 squared minus 5. That's going to be 16 minus 5, and that is 11. Then it says write down the two possible values for the first term in the sequence. So for the first term, what we'll do is we will use negative one equals to t1 being squared and then minus five. So that means negative one plus five equals to t1 squared, which is the first term, four equals to t1 squared, and then square root of 4 is going to give us two values of t1, which is plus minus 2. So your first term can either be positive 2 or negative 2. Question 15 says two villages, Foxy and Glanton, are joined by a footpath and a road. Abdul walks along the footpath from Foxby to Glanton. He walks for 2 hours 14 minutes and arrives at Glanton at 15.10. Calculate the time Abdul left Foxby. So what we're going to do is, 15, 10 is our starting time. And he is walking for 2 hours and 14 minutes. So if I reduce 1 hour from 15, that's going to be 14, 10. Then I reduce another hour, that's going to be 13, 10. So now to reduce 10 minutes, I'm going to write the hour over here. So that's going to be 13, 0, 0, and then to reduce 4 minutes, that's going to be 12, 56. So that is the time when Abdul left. The distance by road between Foxby and Glanton is 15 kilometers. A bus travels along the road between Foxby and Glanton. The bus journey takes 12 minutes. Calculate the average speed in kilometers per hour. So first, let's convert the time into hours. So time in hours is going to be 12 divided by 60. Why 12 divided by 60? Because one hour is equal to 60 minutes. So one minute is going to equal to one over 60 hours. Whenever we're going from a smaller to a bigger unit, we divide. If we're going from a bigger to a smaller unit, we multiply. Since minutes is smaller than hours, so we're going from a smaller to a bigger unit. Hence, we divide 12 by 60. And that's going to equal to 1 over 5. So now your average speed is going to be distance divided by time, which is 15 divided by 1 over 5, which can be rewritten as 15 times 5, and that is going to be 45 kilometers per hour. So that is going to be 75 kilometers per hour. The bearing of Glanton from Fox Bay is 128. Calculate the bearing of Fox Bay from Glanton. So bearing of Glanton from Fox Bay is given as 128. They want the bearing of Fox Bay from Glanton. So that's going to be this entire thing. So remember that in parallel lines, alternate angles are equal. So which means this angle is the same as this part over here. So our bearing will be 180, which is this part, 180 plus 128, which is going to be 308. That is your bearing.
क्वेश्चन सिक्सटीन से इज ट्राइंगल्स ए बी एंड सी आर ड्रॉन ऑन द ग्रेड डिस्क्राइब फुली द सिंगल ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन दैट मैप्स ट्राइंगल ए ऑन टू बी so if you look at triangle a and b they're both equal in size uh there is no uh, change in like uh, its direction it's just that they're opposite now which means they're being reflected so the reflection has to be symmetrical as well at a point so if we draw a line at x equals to negative 1 we see that there's a difference of Two units from the line, from this point, and from here, there's a difference of four units, which means uh, A is being reflected in the line x equals to negative one to get triangle B. Then it says. Describe fully the single transformation that maps A onto triangle C. Now, if you look, compare A and C, there is a change in the direction now. There is no enlargement because the size is still same, so there is no scale factor involved. But there is a rotation. And if we compare the rotation, the rotation is of a ninety degree. At Zero one. This is our center, and our zero one is our center of rotation. And your uh, direction is clockwise. An angle is ninety degrees. Triangle D is the image of triangle A after an enlargement. Scale factor two with center of enlargement of one two. Draw triangle D. So center of enlargement is one two. This is our center of enlargement, and scale factor is given as two. So that means we multiply each a. Uh, Point by two, so first coordinate is one two. Then we have three two, and we have three three. So since uh there's an enlargement by a scale factor of two, this becomes comes over here. This comes over here, and center of enlargement is one two. So this is going to be your image of D. D will have the coordinates of one two remains the same. We have five two, and we have five four. Question seventeen shows us a triangle, and they're saying the diagram shows an isosceles triangle ABC, where AB and AC are equal. D is the point on AC such that angle ADB is ninety, and E is the point on AB such that angle AEC is ninety. Show that triangles ADB and AEC are congruent. So AB is equal to AC. These two angles are ninety. These two angles are also going to be equal because it's a isosceles triangle. So what we will say over here is that since angle ADB is equal to angle AEC, that is one given. Then AB is equal to AC. That is another given. So they're congruent because if we compare the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse are equal for this. There are two right angle triangles. One triangle is 
A, D, B, and the other triangle is A, E, C. So we compare the two right angle triangles. The hypotenuse is equal for both of them. And then our angle E and angle D are equal. Our angle A, B, angle A, B, D will also equal to angle A, C, E. Angle A is common. Angle is already common for both. So we can use angle side angle for this. That is our test for congruency. Solve the simultaneous equations. So we have the first equation x plus 6y equals to 0 and 3x minus 2y equals to 10. So I'm going to make x the subject in the first equation. x equals to negative 6y. I'm going to call this equation 3. I'm going to substitute equation 3 in equation 2, which means 3 times negative 6y minus 2y equals to 10, which is negative 18y minus 2y equals to 10, negative 20y equals to 10, and y is 10 over negative 20, which is negative 1 over 2. And for x, we'll do x equals to negative 6y. So that's going to be negative 6 times negative 1 over 2, which is 3. So x is 3, y is negative 1 over 2. Question 19 says, y is proportional to x minus 1 whole square. Given that y is 18, x is 4, find x equals to 6. y is proportional to x minus 1 whole square, which means y equals to k times x minus 1 whole square. Let's find the value of k by putting y equals to 18 and x equals to 4. 18 equals to k times 3 square, which is 18 equals to 9 times k. 18 over 9 is going to give us k, which is 2. So then we do y equals to 2 times x minus 1 whole square. So y would be 2 times 6 minus 1 whole square which is 2 times 5 whole square, 2 times 25, and that is, that is equal to 50. So y is 50. Question 20 gives us a graph, and it's saying the line y and the line 2y equals to x is drawn on the grid. On the grid, draw the graph for y equals to 2 and y plus x equals to 4. y equals to 2 is going to come over here. y equals to 2. x plus y equals to 4. So for that, we find the intercepts. If we put x equals to 0, y is going to be 4. And if we put y equals to 0, x is going to be 4. So one coordinate is going to be 0, 4. And the other coordinate is going to be 4, 0. So 4, 0, 0, 4. Let's draw that line. Okay, so these are, this is x plus y equals to 4. Now what they want us to do is, on the grid, shade and label the region defined by the following inequalities. x plus y is less than equal to 4. So let me just write this down. x plus y is less than equal to 4. 
2y is greater than or equal to x, y is less than or equal to 2, and x is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So now if we go back to our graph, y is less than or equal to 2. So that is, once again, underneath the line. Then it says x plus y is less than or equal to 4. So less than or equal to 4 is going to be this line under the graph. And 2y is greater than or equal to x. y is greater than or equal to x. So that is going to be above it. So lastly, we said that x is greater than or equal to 0. So x is greater than or equal to 0 is going to come on this in this region. So this is our shaded part. Factorize 3cx plus 2bx minus 6cy minus 4by. So I'm going to factor by grouping. This is going to be one group and this is going to be another group. Between the first two terms, we have x commons, x bracket 3c plus 2b. Between the second two terms, we have negative 2y common. It's going to be 3c plus 2b again. Between x and negative 2y, we have 3c plus 2b common. So that's going to be x minus 2y. And that is your factorized answer. Then it says factorize 6x squared plus 7x minus 10. It's a quadratic equation. So we'll use middle term breakage. We know 6 times 10 is 60. Factors of 60 are 30 times 2, 20 times 3, 60 times 1, and 6 times 10. We have 15 times 4, and we have 12 times 5. So if we look at these factors, only 12 minus 5 gives us 7. 15 minus 4 would give us 11. 10 minus 6 would give, would give us 4. 60 minus 1 would give us 59. 20 minus 3 would be 17 and so on. So we're going to replace 7x the middle term with plus 12x minus 5x minus 10. And then we again factor by grouping. Between the first two terms, we have 6x common. So x plus 2. And between the third and the fourth term, we have negative 5 common. So x plus 2 again in the bracket. So that's going to be x plus 2 times 6x minus 5. So that is your factorized version. A car has a mass of 2400 kg correct to the nearest 100 kilograms. A caravan has a mass of 1460 kg correct to the nearest 10 kilograms. Calculate the lower bound for the total mass of the car and the caravan. So we first find the degree of accuracy of your mass of car. That's going to be 100 divided by 2, which is 50. So your lower bound of car is going to be 2400 minus 50, which is 2350 kg. Then for the degree of accuracy of mass of the caravan, we're going to do 10 divided by 2 because it was to the nearest 10 kilograms. So that's going to be 5. So lower bound is going to be 1460 minus 5, which is going to be 1455 kg. So now total is going to be the lower bound of the total. That is going to be the sum of these two values. So we're going to add 1455 to 
2350, which is going to equal to 3805 kg. Question 3 says a equals to b square plus c over d. Find a when b is 4 times 10 square, c is 6 times 10 cube, and d is 2 times 10 square. So a is going to be 4 times 10 square, 4 times 10 square whole square, plus 6 times 10 cube divided by 2 times 10 square. So 4 times 10 square is going to be 16 times 10 to the power of 4 plus 6 times 10 cube over 2 times 10 square. You solve the numerator first. So between 16 and 6, we have 2 common. So 2 times 10 cube is common. Inside the bracket, we'll have 8 times 10 plus 3. That is going to give us 2 times 10 cube times uh, 83 over 2 times 10 square. So the 2s get cancelled out and 10 cube divided by 10 square is 10. So 10 times 83, which is 830. And in standard form, that's going to be 8.3 times 10 to the power of 2. Rearrange the formula to make B the subject. So the formula is A equals to B square plus C over 2. Over D, sorry. So we do A times D equals to B square plus C. We got rid of the fraction. Then we do AD minus C equals to B square. And then we square root this. So AD minus C equals to B and plus minus outside because a square root has a positive and a negative value. Then m times 10 to the power of 4 plus m times 10 square equals to 36,360. Work out m times 10 to the power of 4 minus m times 10 square. What we'll do is that we know that m times 10 to the power of 4 plus m, 10, m times 10 square is 36,360. So m times 10 to the power of 4 is basically m with four zeros after that. And m times 10 square is m with two zeros after it. So now if we add the two, this result is equal to 36,360. So if we highlight this m0 over here and m0 over here, that's equal to 36 which means m0, which is m times 10, and m0 has the value of 36. So if 36 is m times 10, which means m is going to be 36 divided by 10, which is 3.6. Now let's use that over here. So 3.6 times 10 to the power of 4 minus 3.6 times 10 square. So that's going to be 36,000 minus 360, 35640. So that is your value for this. Question 24 says we have two matrices M and N. Find M minus N. So that's going to be 5213 minus. 4, 3, negative 2, 0. So 5 minus 4, 1 minus negative 2, 2 minus 3, and 3 minus 0. And that's going to be 1, 3, negative 1, and 3. That is your answer for that. Then we have P, Q, and P, Q. Find the value of C and D. 
So we're going to do P times Q, which is 2C4 negative 5 times 3 negative 2 2D. So first row goes with the first column, then the first row with the second column, and then we repeat the second row with the first column and the second column, which means 2 times 3 plus 4 times negative 2. Then 2 times 2 plus 4 times D. Then C times 3 and minus 5 times negative 2. C times 2 minus 5 times D. This entire thing equals to negative 2, 19, 0, 11. So that's going to give us of 2, 19, 0, 11 is equal to 6 minus 8, 3C plus 10, and 4 plus 4D, and 2C minus 5D. So 0 equals to 4 plus 4D. This and this are equal. So negative 4 equals to 4D and negative 1 equals to D. Then this is equal to this, which means 19 equals to 3C plus 10. 19 minus 10 equals to 3C. 9 equals to 3C and 3 equals to C. So that's the value of C and D. Question 25 says the diagram shows a circle center 0, 1 and P is 3, 5, which is a point on the circumference of the circle. Find the equation of the tangent at P. So what we'll do is first we'll find the gradient of the line CP. So M of CP is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that's going to be 5 minus 1 over 3 minus 0, which is 4 over 3. Now, if you look at this, the tangent at the circumference is always at right angle to a line coming from the circumference towards the center of the circle. So that means this is at 90 degrees, which means the gradient of m1 which is the line CP and M2, which is the tangent, is going to give the product of these two values will give us negative one. So M1 times M2 will equal to negative one. M1 is four over three times M2, which is the gradient of the tangent. So M2 is equal to negative one times three over four, which is negative three over four. So now we're going to use this gradient and we're going to use point P to find the equation of the tangent, which is going to be y minus 5 equals to negative 3 or 4 times x minus 3. 4 times y minus 5 equals to negative 3x plus 9. I expanded the bracket and cross multiplied the denominator with the left hand side. So that's 4y minus 20 equals to negative 3x plus 9. And our answer would be 4y equals to negative 3x plus 29. That is your equation of the tangent.